Live from Las Vegas, it's theCUBE. Covering UiPath Forward Americas 2019. Brought to you by UiPath. Welcome back to UiPath Forward 3. This is UiPath's third North American conference. We're here at the Bellagio Hotel. You're watching theCUBE, the leader in live tech coverage. We go out to the events, we extract the signal from the noise, we pick the brains of experts. Ke Kevin Krohn is here. He's the financial services intelligent automation leader at PwC. Kevin, thanks for coming on theCUBE. Thanks for having me. You're very welcome. So, financial services has always been kind of a, a leading indicator of technology adoption. Uh, I, I presume that automation is, is no difference, but you know, you're in the New York area, you're, you're belly to belly with the financial services uh, companies, the, the big whales. What's going on in FS these days? Sure, so as we look across the financial services industry, um, they were one of the leaders with automation more because the overarching business environment really forced them. As we looked at um, the regulatory burden that a lot of our banking clients were under over the past um, decade, kind of post-crash, that really um, has kind of forced two things. One, it's limited the amount of um, discretionary spend that they have to spend on really big technology transformation projects. It's also forced a lot of margin pressure and having to think about uh, differently how they can run their business at a much lower and more effective price point. And so that's um, driven automation to the top. And when we've seen tools like UiPath and kind of the broader RPA ecosystem becoming kind of you know, the right technology at the right time of being able to um, really kind of embrace that, 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 that right sizing agenda in the financial services sector. Yeah, and financial services, the macro level, they're a little bit out of favor right now. You had this, what we thought was this rising interest rate environment, and that's reversed, and so that's not necessarily good for them. So they got to look for other ways to sort of drive the bottom line. Um, so maybe you could talk a little bit about, you know, gen generally, um, where you're seeing automation, um, back office, front office, you know, think about the maturity curve. What are the leaders doing? What are the, what's the sort of best practice right now for intelligent automation, RPA? Sure, so as we look at intelligent automation right now, I think one of the interesting things, uh, financial services was an early adopter, so a lot of, uh, a lot of the, the big banks and asset managers and insurance companies really started investing in this, this class of technology four, five, six, seven years ago. And so we're actually seeing the, the, the early returns from, from those, which is informing how this, is, you know, this topic goes to other industries. But I think as we look at those returns, we see a couple of major challenges. Um, there's challenges with getting the scaling the technology Technology. There's challenges with getting the right return on investment and proving the business case, and there's challenges of really thinking through kind of change management and what impact that this is going to have on the workforce. And you know, getting maybe taking it down a level to the um, into the technology place. I think one of the, the challenges we've seen is there's almost a split happening um, and how our clients are thinking about this. In one end, it's really around solving some of the, the, the meatiest, hardest, end-to-end -end process automation challenges, and that, in a lot of cases, um, means having to leverage RPA, but also means having to leverage other technologies, um, really embracing artificial intelligence, um, looking at things like intelligent data extraction and conversational interfaces, and really thinking through um, you know, both how do you re-engineer a process, and then how do you automate it end-to-end. -end. On the flip side, though, so um, that only covers a certain portion of the organization. You're only kind of going after, called the whale processes within your organization. We see a second channel, which is really, how do you think about changing the nature of work and everything else that you do? And the concept of citizen-led innovation is really starting to take off and be embraced. And kind of put simply, that's putting some of these tools in the hands of business users that are clients, not the technology departments, and letting them actually drive um, automating some of the, the mundane things that they do on a day-to-day -day basis. And so, you're seeing kind of this enterprise channel and the citizen-led channel kind of emerge as the, the two tracks um, approach to automation. So, that's interesting. Okay, so the, the latter, changing the nature of work, is, is you're saying largely automating existing mundane processes, kind of paving the cow path, as I sometimes say. However, if, if, it's, a, if it's not the most efficient processy, to begin with, process to begin with, they need to sort of relook at that, and that maybe falls into the to the to the former category. The enterprise led. Uh, and so, where are people investing in both? Are they are they just hitting the low hanging fruit? And 
We're, we're seeing an investment in both, and uh, PwC's view is that a well-functioning automation program should have both channels, and each channel should be informing the other. So if citizens are coming up with ideas of things that they can um, automate themselves, that's great, but those should also be contributed into the kind of broader ecosystem, and there may be, um, let's, let's call it grander ways to, to, to solve that problem, both from a technology perspective and from a process re-engineering perspective. Is there, a, is there an automation ex officio, or is there a chief who's sort of looking at all this stuff, or is it more organic? It's, you know, one of the, I think, interesting things we've seen and learned from our clients over the past couple of years is the, the you know, we, thought there would be an emergence of a you know, chief automation officer or, or something like that, but really the automation agenda is owned in so many different places within our clients and it's not consistent client to client. In some cases, it's really a CIO owned topic. A lot of cases, it's more of a chief operating officer, chief digital officer, chief transformation officer. We're also seeing a push um, at the chief HR uh, officer mm -hmm. level because this is really, you know, there's a, there's a big question in terms of thinking about kind of skills and how you equip your workforce with the right digital skills for the future, which is now putting HR at the table for this, which is a place where I think traditionally with big technology transformations, they've never really sat. So, in thinking about um, ROI, you know, you've, you've laid out this sort of bifurcated you know, paths, two vectors, the hard sort of end-to-end -end problems and then the sort of low-hanging fruit changing the way to work. I would presume the second one gives you the quick hit, you know, faster break even, but probably lower net present value. Yep. Um, and, and so maybe you could talk a little bit about the ROI equation and how people are looking at that. Yeah, it, it's interesting, because I think, yeah, to your point, I think an enterprise-led initiative, you're going to want to define a business case and say this is why we're doing it and what we're looking to achieve. Going down a citizen-led channel, that's a harder thing to do because you don't want to stifle innovation in your organization. One of our views is that the people that sit closest to the business process are the ones that should be coming up with the right ideas if they are given the right upscaling, the right tools at their disposal. Um, but, you know, it's, it's a bottoms-up exercise, and so, again, going back to the, the concept of having a kind of an ecosystem with both an enterprise channel and a citizen channel um, is, is important because you're, at the enterprise level you're going to need to understand what type of benefits are actually being created at the, you know, at the, the micro level and figure out two things. One, are there things that, you know, do, have we built enough that we can start to release capacity from organization? Um, or is there something else that if I put in will allow us to really think about transforming our business? So it's a, it's a lever, it's not the, the end solution, right? When I tell people about you that don't know what RPA is, I say, yeah, it's, a, it's a lot of back office stuff, and it is. Um, but we heard today that uh, from one of the keynotes that you know we got to move from the back office to the to the front office. How much is that happening in financial services, and how much of a sort of a holistic end-to-end -end strategy are you seeing? I'm sure you guys are prom you know, promoting that or fans of that because you're going to get a much bigger business impact. It's transformational, but uh, where are we at in the maturity of, of that all? Yeah, it, it's interesting, right? So we you know staying on the theme of the enterprise and citizen-led innovation levers. You know, the enterprise. Um, it, you know, innovation levers tend to be focused more in the, the back office, high transaction volume type processes. I think when we look at the citizen-led channel, a lot of the ideas that have been coming out and, our and with our clients are starting to embrace this, they tend to be more front office oriented processes. There's lots of things, especially in you know, client servicing or you know, that are you know, tasks that are done that are somewhat mundane and um, you know it's the, the business case in Lockheed isn't necessarily about capacity, it's about client experience and customer service. So you know you can take the um, you know the, the the wealth advisor that has to um, log into five different systems to answer a simple client question. That's a you know that's a process that being able to actually have an automated way to generate that same thing at their fingertips um, you know could be really powerful. And so there's a big push there. I think the interesting part on the uh, um, going back to your, your business case question from before, is that um, you know, the, the business case for a lot of those types of automations, um, it's not just a factor of um, you know, have we built enough that we think that there's benefit, it's also about adoption. So if I build a 
robot to automate that wealth advisor process that, that I just noted, if 50 wealth advisors can adopt that rather than one wealth advisor, it's going to be a much greater business case. And that's a much, that's a different way of thinking about business case in the RPA sense, because most people tend to think, here's a process, this process, I have five people that run this on a day-to-day -day basis, um, and here's, here's my business case. In this case, it's I built something really innovative. If I can get 100 people to use this, because it's, it, and it takes 10 minutes out of their day, there's real, there's, there's real time there, but it, it is causing a lot of our clients to think differently. So, you, you talk about three things, as, as challenges, scale, the business case, which you just talked about, and change management. Is that part of the, and they're, they're interrelated, is that part of the challenge with, with scale? It is part of the challenge. I mean, just, you know, you know building on uh, the, the last point around adoption, you know, the, what we're doing, what we're talking about here with RPA, I think people that live in the RPA space day to day, this, to us, this almost becomes second nature, and like, yeah, the technology's not that complicated, this is very basic, but you start going out to an entire organization, and especially outside of technology, um, it's it's new, and so the you know the change management is really important, um, and it's important we, I, we view from two lenses. One is really thinking about how do you. Um, upskill your workforce at a minimum so they know what technology is actually out there. It doesn't necessarily mean you're going to make everyone a bot builder in your organization, but knowing what RPA is and knowing that, hey, I have some tools to go help solve a given business problem is really important. But, uh, so, you know, the, the, uh, the second point that we think is really important in here is the ability to um, really think about Sorry, really think about the, um, you know, what the long-term impact of, of um, you know, the overall organizational model and how that actually adopts to using automation over time. And, and that ties into change management, which is the other thing. Yeah. You know, people don't like change. Um, the other thing I, we heard this morning, um, uh, Craig LeClaire, the forestry analyst, talked about how a lot of robots are idle sitting around idle, you know, at the orchestrator. So I was, I was thinking, well, we're seeing SaaS models emerge. You know, UiPath announced their, their cloud product. And I, I would expect you're going to see new pricing models as well, kind of usage based pricing, which is kind of generally not how things are priced today, but is that something that customers are pushing for? Or? Definitely, I mean, I think there's, um, there's two, two things we hear from customers in this space. I think as RPA, as a product is developed, you know, I think there was a push uh, with most, with all the vendors towards kind of what's priced per bot, but the concept of a, a bot is a somewhat ambiguous concept to a lot of our clients, and what our clients really want is to price at value, right, and understand um, if I'm building bots that are you know, covering this part of the organization, I'm appropriately paying for this, um, rather than worry about how much workload did I put onto one bot versus another. I think with the, with the mass adoption of cloud and the fact that the RPA ecosystem is quickly moving from an on-prem solution to a cloud-based solution, I think a lot of this is just going to happen naturally um, over time. I think the other, but the, I think the other really important part in there is not to just make this a technology question about the kind of the pricing, it's also a question on value delivered and realizing the benefits case and can you actually tie what those realized benefits are to what the actual price that you're actually going to pay for the, the software is. Right. All right, you ready for some curveballs? Sure. Okay, I love it. so you're, you know, thought leader. Uh, you work for one of the largest, you know, consultancies on the planet, global scale. You guys do some really great work. Um, disruption. You talk, we talk about digital transformation. Automation obviously plays in there. Blockchain, AI, you know, RPA, etc. Do you do you think that banks will lose control of payment systems? I'm not, sh I would say the, pro the biggest problems that, that banks are facing um, with regards to that isn't necessarily whether they control the payment system or not. I actually think it's how effective they can run the system internally. I mean, I'm, a, I'm an automation guy, right? My goal is to make clients run as efficiently and as effectively as possible. And I look at a lot of the legacy debt that sits within a lot of our clients' infrastructure. I think that's the biggest problem to tackle. I think if they don't tackle that and are not successful with topics like RPA and automation, it, it's going to create the forces of nature that allow some of the broader disruption to happen. So, it's, you know, to me, at least in my mind, it's one of these things that you, you have your agenda and what you can control. These are the things that you actually should
should be focusing on so you're set up to compete with some of the big disruptors in the future. Yeah, interesting. I mean, that's one industry, there's disruption all around us, but that's one industry, along with healthcare and you know, defense, that hasn't been highly disrupted yet because it's very high risk. Not only that, they're, you know, they've got a very strong relationship with the government, so this, you know, and they're big and they're well funded, but, but it seems like that disruption scenario is coming to financial services. When you talk to people in the industry, they certainly see it, but there's also a lot of complacency. It's like, hey, we're a big, big FS, we're doing really well. Um, thoughts on that? Um, you know, I, there is, you know, when we look across, and I'll just say kind of technology investment in the banking sector, Big banks and asset managers, insurance companies are some of the biggest spenders on technology out there. And, and you know, if you look, look at a lot of the commentary that comes out of analyst calls, there's a pretty consistent uh, push, A, to talk about um, you know, the, a banking organization as a technology company or some form of that. And there's also a big push to talk about how much money they're spending. That's great, but we've also, you know, I think when you, you kind of look under the covers, there's been a lot of historical challenges with um, with implementing big technology projects in banks. There's a lot of legacy debt that's been built over the past 25 years, and complexity, really thinking about this from a front to back perspective, like from the point, you know, taking a, you know, the trading side of a bank, looking at the point of trade entry through post-trade processing, through finance processing, through kind of every step in the life cycle, it's still um, run from a technology perspective probably not as efficient as possible. And I think especially when you get outside the front office area and some of the training areas and look at that. So there's a ton of opportunity for improvement and, and you know, kind of building on the last theme. I think to the extent that technologies like RPA and automation are embraced, it helps think about that problem a little bit differently and gives us a chance to tackle some of these big, meaty, legacy problems that have been around for a while. If we're successful at this and we can force you know, the ROI to be proved, we can force the change management exercise to happen, I think it sets our clients up for, again, for success to avoid some of the, these disruptive factors. Yeah, so huge opportunity then for UiPath and some of its competitors. Um, you know, penetration-wise, adoption-wise, you know, where, where do you, where, what inning are we in? Uh, inning two. Yeah, okay, uh, we're, so. we're, we're in early days. I mean, I think we've seen a ton of interest, a ton of excitement from our clients, but you know, our surveys of, of, of the financial services industry, um, most clients will acknowledge they're past the, the piled and proof of concept phase, and they're maybe even past the first 10 bot phase, but they're not at scale, yeah. right? And I think until, Three things happen. I think until you know, we can prove that the technology is being used, um, you know, from an organizational coverage across a much wider swath than it is today. I think when we can prove that there's actually a real demonstrable benefit happening from a from an organizational operating model perspective, and to the extent that the workforce is actually embracing this and not opposing it, I think we'll you know be in a much better position to say, hey, we're we're now getting to ending five or six, and 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 this this picture is becoming more complete. But it's still early. Yeah. A lot of opportunities. Kevin, thanks very much for coming to theCUBE. It was great to thank have you. you. Thank you for having me. All right, and thank you for watching. We're right back with our next guest. Right after this short break, you're watching theCUBE live from UiPath Forward 2019 at the Bellagio. We'll be right back.